Ahoy Rovers! Well, the strong back portion of the build is now complete. I did frame five yesterday with Mrs. Rover's help and it only took about 45 minutes. So all totaled, I'd say the strong back took about two days. Uh, it could have been done considerably faster, of course. Now, the fun bit really begins because I'm going to start lofting. And before you say, well, that sounds complicated, it couldn't be any easier really because I've been really hammering on with the architect about keeping this simple because we want to empower just about anybody to be able to build these boats. So the lofting process is very simple. It involves plywood, uh, you know, for the, the hull plating. And as a result, the lines are really quite straight. So that makes, that makes lofting frames pretty easy. You just have to be accurate and I'll, I'll walk you through that. So in order to do that, what I did was, I, I, you need a lofting table and it sounds really complicated. And when my buddy Brian does his big build of the 38 foot spray, it will be complicated. But in my case, it's hardly even a lofting table. It's a lofting surface. It's two sheets of OSB. And, and you saw Mrs. Rover uh, painting those last week. So anyway, enough talk. I'll show you what, what's involved and how you mark it out. Anyway, a lot to do, time to crack on. Okay, so what you want to do on the lofting table is establish an access. So in this case, I have the joint, which will be my center line of the boat. And now I want to establish a water line. And I want to put it in a position where I still have enough room for the depth of the frame below the water line and enough room on the, uh, laugh, uh, the, the lofting table for what's above the water line of all the frames. So in this case, I've chosen just an arbitrary point of 16 inches, which is uh, 400 millimeters. And I'm just using a piece of plywood. Now, this piece of plywood, I have had this for years. I use this plywood all the time uh, for when I'm lofting out, well, you know, um, pieces of furniture or uh, checking on um, uh, making trusses, uh, things like that. So it's good to have just a straight edge, but it could be anything. It could be a piece of aluminum, you name it. All right, so we have, we have this straight edge now set up at 16 inches. So I'll just make a line. Nice and dark because we'll be using this reference line for everything from this point on. Now, after this, I'll start with the smallest frame and I'll lay it out and then I'll build it and then I'll lay out the next largest frame so that I'm, I'm trying to avoid uh, cluttering up my lines too much. Anyway, time to crack on with that. Well, if you're not sure what lofting is, here's a quick overview. Now, if you're not interested in the lofting process, skip ahead to timestamp 19 minutes and 40 seconds. So in this portion right now, I'm going to lay out the transom, which is uh, 
Well, a little more complex than that first frame, frame five. So this is the last frame I'm doing. I'm, I'm well practiced at this point, but you're going to get a feeling for how long it takes to lay one of these out. All right. So the first thing we do is we start at our water line, which is our reference point, and our center line, which is the seam right here. And they're running perpendicular to each other. We grab our tape measure, we take a look at the drawing, and we see where the bottom of the boat is. So the bottom of the boat, of course, is below the water line, but by how much? So it tells me right on the plan there. So I measure it out. I like to use a sharp pencil for this just to be accurate. And then from there I see how wide is the boat. So I measure out from there. And I give myself a small little reference line. Then I come down the same depth that I just did on the center line. Okay. I do the same over here. Now once I have that, I can actually draw the bottom of the boat at that point. So I use my big straight edge for that. I line up those three points, the center line and bottom edge, so what would be the bottom of the chine. Take a little bit of time to get this absolutely correct. There we go. Then mark it. And go a little oversized. Then what I like to do is put a little arrow to it. identify it so that's a T for transom and I put a circle around there. And the reason I do this is because I don't know if the camera is picking it up but there are a lot of lines because there are six frames in total. Like I said this is the last one. So once you establish the bottom of the boat from the water line the next thing you want to do is establish the shear line, so the top of this frame. So I have that measurement on here as well. And the measurement is given to me from the bottom of the boat. And as luck would have it, it lines up pretty much exactly where the shear line of uh, frame number one is. No surprise really because the boat is fairly flat on the cockpit area and then it sweeps up to the bow. So I can use the very same line that we established and all I need to do now is find out what the offset is. I have that measurement listed right here. and I identify this so not to be confused. So now I 
identify this point. So I have the bottom of the boat and the top of the boat, but there is a chine. So the boat goes down, angles over, and then the bottom. So I need to determine where that chine is. And I have a number that tells me the vertical distance down to the top of the chine. So that's my next target. There's where it'll end up. It's a distance over. And somewhere around. Pretty busy area. Make a fresh line. Same on this side. Okay, so now that I have those two lines, that tells me the top of the uh, chine. So, I make a little line across the, those two points. Hopefully I can find them again. There's one. And there's the other. Again, the trick is to be accurate. And you know that you want to be running, all these lines have to be parallel to each other, the bottoms, because it has a relatively flat bottom for the most part. So we're lined up well. Okay, so now that we have that distance, we need to determine where does the chine take place from the center line. And again, we have that right on the plan. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention is when you do make this line, those two reference lines, give yourself a reference line in the center here as well and give it a name. So that's T for transom, and a little arrow. So starting there, go out to my line, check my measurement, Right, so then what I like to do at this point is I like to just check the overall to make sure I haven't made some big glaring mistake. So at this point, all that's left to do is just connect the dots. 
So we know that we start here. We go out to the line I just developed. And then we go from that line up to the reference point on the shear line. You want to go past the shear line so that you can extend your temporary frame well past because we need to secure it to the strong back. Same on the other side. You find the bottom. So I've circled it with a T as you know and another one over here with a T so I just connect those two lines. We have an outline starting right here, coming down to the uh, chine, over to the bottom, across the bottom, the chine comes up, and then from the chine point to the shear line. That probably took about 11 minutes, but like I said, this is my sixth one. Um, Probably the first one took a little bit longer than that, but not much. It's fairly straightforward. You just want to be accurate. And finally, when you lay this out, the best thing to do is stand back and take a big look at it and make sure that it looks symmetrical. Then when you're happy with it, then you start laying out the wood for the temporary frames. It's really just that easy. Anyway, I have to crack on with this whole building of this frame now. Now it's time to cut a piece of wood to fit inside these lofting lines. So we're going to use a bevel. Just, this is a beautiful piece of oak that will be used as one of the floor timbers, but I'm just using it as a spacer right now. And I'm leaning the bevel up against that. And then you take the bevel and you just line it up to your line. I'm probably covering this over with my hands, but after you get it set up, you can see there it lines up perfectly. So now I have recorded this angle with the bevel. Now I'm just going to run over to the chop saw. So this is just a compound miter saw, not a very expensive one. Anybody can afford one of these these days. And I'm just going to adjust it to the angle. Best way to do it is line up this red bar with the blade and you'll find that you're you're pretty much dead on. Okay, so there we have it. Lock it in place. Now, grab the piece of wood. Right, so now let's take this back over and just check it against the actual drawing, make sure we're right. And we're looking really good. So now I just have to mark the length of it. So right off of the loft, and that's why we do this loft. And I make a little indication on the board like that, which is telling me Make the angle that way. Don't get confused and make it the other way. And then it's just back to the chop saw. Finish it off. All right, so I'm about to start frame four. I've already lofted the lines and I've cut the uh, one by four to the correct sizes and you can see that I'm doing a little bit of a close up here. And I'm using these weights just to hold everything in place. 
and I'm going to attach the gussets next. You can also see that the lines on my lofting board, well, they're uh, getting a little bit complicated, so I've been marking them with uh, numbers and circles. For example, you can see right here, I've got number three pointing to that point right there. Um, otherwise, it just gets really confusing. Okay, so I have pre-cut gussets that will cover these joints. And I've shaped them just a little bit so that they fit nicely and we get really good support. So, yeah, that looks good. I then make a little line. And the reason for that is so I can get some construction adhesive down. Then with the OSB, I'm actually putting the shiny side down because it's smoother and uh, it'll make a better glue joint. So just with this construction adhesive, you've got to try to move it around a bit and then you're happy with it. Double check your lines at this point that we're still on our lofting lines. And if we are, good, go for it and just staple it in place. Now, I'll just explain what I'm going to do. On the underside, we will have this piece of ply. And the reason I'm having ply on one side and OSB on the other is because the ply is a half an inch. And that is the offset that I've set up. The OSB is approximately half an inch, but it tends to expand and change uh, its thickness a little bit. So it's not, it's not that reliable. Why am I not using ply on both sides? Well, you could, and that's a good solution, but ply is about twice the price as OSB, and I really don't need it on the one side. I, don't, I only need the ply on one side. So that's the reason. Now the reason I'm putting this little strip of OSB on here is just to keep the frame from spreading out. So it's just a temporary brace and I'll just put it on with screws because I'll be removing it once we actually install uh, the frame. Now this frame is locked in place. Um, I'm going to pick it up gently, flip it over, and then I'm going to put the ply on. But before I do that, it's important that I mark where the water line is on here, and also where the top of the shear uh, is. And if you had the plans in front of you, that would make sense. So this line right here, this represents the water line. So I'm going to make a little indication right there. And put W L. So that's the water line, and I'll do the same on the opposite side. So again, this line right here is the water line. And right here, this is this line right here represents the top of the shear. So I'm indicating that, and I'll just put S for shear. All right, now we can actually take this and 
turn it over and put the plywood gussets on those joints. And that will go right there. Looks good. So again, this is just construction grade plywood, the kind that would go on the exterior of the building. Uh, it has a smooth side and it has a rough side. So again, you want to make sure that your cuts and everything line up so the smooth side goes down because that'll be just a better glue joint. Now what I've done is I've actually changed the fasteners up in this. It's now an inch and a half, so those fasteners will go right through to the other side and hold everything together. These uh, staples, these are quarter inch crown staples, they're very inexpensive. Don't be afraid to use a lot. It'll help hold everything together while the glue sets up. So let's put this down and again we're just going to make sure that the plywood is covering all the joints and I'm leaving myself about an eighth of an inch all the way along the bottom because I don't want the plywood to get in the way of the actual plating of the boat. Frame four is now complete. So after you get the one by four laid out on your layout lines, then you need to hold it together. So to hold it together, I've been making these plywood gussets. So to go about that, just take them and center them over top of what you're working on. Bring them in about an eighth of an inch from the edge. That way when the edge, the edge will stay fair when we put the ply over top. And when you're happy with that, and that looks pretty good, then just make a little line right up here about an eighth of an inch in from the edge of the one by four. And the same down here. Then make a straight line. And then everything on this side of the line gets cut off. Same over here. And everything on this side of the line gets cut off. Then we'll take it over to the chop saw and make quick work of it. Now as far as the gussets go, those are the pieces of plywood and OSB that cover the chine area and lock it into place. What I did was I took some plywood and some scrap OSB, I cut it into one foot wide strips by two feet long. Best way to do this on a chop saw is take your line and sight along this little red safety piece here and then when you see it line up with that, Take a second to get it right. Then just lock it in place. Safety wise on this tool, it's a very, very safe tool. The key is keep your fingers out of this area with, that are marked in red and you can't really go wrong. The other key is don't ever cross your arms when you're cutting. Always make sure you set up with your arms in the right side. All right, I have one more cut to make. Normally I would do all, all four of this cut, 
and then I would do all four of this cut, but I just want to demonstrate this as a pattern. There we go, this will fit right over top of the chine area and lock it in place. Now in the next video, I'll be installing those temporary frames on the strong back, and I'll also be fabricating the stem piece, which will be actually the first permanent piece of the boat that'll be installed. I, I also want to uh, give you an update on the cost so far, because I have purchased the plywood, and uh, you know the oak and some of the pine, but I also have a shipment coming with the epoxy and the fiberglass. So by the next video, I should be in a position where I can give you the full cost of all, the, of all that material, and that'll give you a pretty good idea of the overall cost, or at least give you some idea of the overall cost. Now there were a number, actually quite a number of inquiries from you uh, asking for construction plans or early construction plans, or maybe we would call them beta plans, plans that are still being developed so that you can get started. I have had an in-depth discussion with my naval architect, Andy, and we agree it's best to stay the course on producing a finished set of drawings by late November. You see, we're still hashing out the placement of bulkheads and frames and other details, I mean, these all have to work together to make a strong and what we hope will be an absolutely iconic small ocean cruiser. These things take time and we are both staying focused on getting it right. So in short, we can expect construction plans about the end of November. Well, it's an honor to add five new names to the Benefactor's bulkhead. Diana Sparapani, Marco Schall, Matthew Evans Kosh, Flight Deck Solutions Limited, and Paul Finn. These folks have made a donation of $100 US or more, and their names will be going on a bulkhead inside Wave Rover and will be traveling with me on her circumnavigation. These funds make a great difference in offsetting the costs of materials. So a great big thank you. I'd also like to take a moment to welcome our four new patrons on board. Stan Moon, Matt Evans Kosh, Louis Van de Mer, and Jesus Fuentes. Your pledges of support help the channel in so many ways. Thank you so much. So as always Rovers, thanks for watching.